After years of production delays, Halo finally premiered on Paramount Plus a couple of weeks ago. The initial reaction from the fandom, though, is probably not what the showmakers were hoping for. But is there any substance to this criticism from fans, or does it stem from a toxic vocal minority? Let's dive in and find out. First up, Halo TV show does not need to copy everything from the games. Of course, whenever you adapt a beloved franchise to any other form of media, people are going to draw a one-to-one -one comparison with the source material. This is even more true for video games where hardcore fans can get extremely toxic and unreasonable at times. But the truth is that games and TV are so vastly different that doing a complete copy would not result in anything other than a trash fire. So when the Halo TV show was not exactly like the video games in which you spend more time shooting aliens than building a narrative, there was obviously tons of backlash. We're obviously joking here, but the differences between the show and the games were probably more apparent than what the fans wanted. However, we also knew that before the show came out as it was made clear that this would not follow the canon of the games and will have its own story. Then what's so different about the Halo TV show that has made people raise pitchforks against it? Next, the show borrows a lot of its ideas from the novels. Not only does Halo have rich lore in games, but it adds a lot of missing details with the help of books. We've had a lot of great Halo books explaining some of the events of the games and offering a different perspective. And from past examples, we know that adapting a book into a TV format is way easier than doing it with a game. This is exactly why the showrunners borrowed a lot of ideas from the novels. Also, there's currently a rampant notion among the Halo fandom that the producers of the show did not even play the game. But we can confirm that this is simply not true, as most of the cast and those involved in the production did sit through all the games and core material. And the comments about them not focusing on the games were taken out of context, as they were just describing their visit to 343 Industry Studio. Up next, Halo TV is full of nods to the core canon. So rest assured, the people may making the show are not clueless about the lore and the legacy of this franchise. Some changes have to be made though, obviously to adapt to a different medium. Even with these changes, however, the Halo TV show is a lot closer to the canon lore than you might have expected. Here are some of the things in actual Halo lore that fans might have missed in the show. First, we have Master Chief. Being the main character of the series and the center of attention, it's obvious that the fans would recognize glaring differences in Master Chief before anyone else. In the games, he's always been a vessel for the player to don the armor. However, more recent entries like Halo Infinite have shown us the human side of the Chief as well, with him questioning his own decisions. The show, in our opinion, does a great job at portraying that emotion and humanizing the Master Chief. Let's be honest here, we've seen way too many sci-fi movies with emotionless super soldiers, and making John 117's character more interesting was definitely the right move. He also wears his most iconic Mark V armor, which may not make sense for the timeline but is the most recognizable. All that being said though, the biggest point of contention for Chief's character is the fact that he removes his helmet frequently during the show. This is obviously not something that we see in the games, as he never takes his helmet off during any of those. But in canon, Master Chief does take off his helmet in a lot of instances, and many novels also clearly describe his facial features. Let's be clear here, this is not the Mandalorian, and Spartans don't have some sacred oath to keep their helmets on at all times. So a Spartan taking off his helmet in casual situations as mentioned in the novels should not be a big deal. The reason why we don't see his face in the games is partially because most of our time there is spent in a war zone. We understand why fans might be having a hard time accepting this change though, but trust us, as soon as you get over this hump, the show instantly gets way better. Next, the locations in Halo TV show. In the first two episodes alone, we see a lot of locations in the Halo TV show. Places like Madrigal, The Rubble, Reach, and High Charity are all present in the Halo lore. In fact, while places like The Rubble and Madrigal aren't really a part of the games, they have been explored in detail detail in the novels, and the show does a good job of portraying the general vibe of these places. And obviously, fans are fully familiar with Reach and High Charity, both of which are shown in stunning detail during the show. Also, did you know that the Forerunner artifact that Chief finds on Madrigal is also somewhat adjacent to the video game canon? In the novel Fall of Reach, he actually finds a similar object on another planet, Sigma Octanus 4, just a few months before the first game and the Fall of Reach. So this could mean that we get to visit the Halo ring in the show very soon. Next, Next up, the Blessed Ones. In Episode 2 of the Halo TV show, we see a lot of emphasis on the idea of the Blessed One. These are humans who have the ability to interact with Forerunner artifacts and activate them. And we see the Master Chief is also a Blessed One. Not only that, but the Covenant also has a human with them who seemingly has the same abilities. And while there is no human-aiding Covenant in the Halo lore, the idea of the Blessed Ones does exist. In Core Canon, these Blessed Ones who can interact with Forerunner artifacts are referred to as the Reclaimers. 
there are a lot of them, including Sergeant Johnson, Miranda Keys, and Dr. Catherine Halsey. And Silver Team is just a reskinned Blue Team. Master Chief has a new team next to him in the show called Silver Team. However, this is just a mere reskin of the Blue Team, as the idea is pretty much the same. They may have different names and appearances, but that's about it. Even their weapon loadouts are the same as the Blue Team. And when it comes to their loyalty, we see them emulate the Blue Team here as well. For instance, when Spartan 117 goes rogue and flies off with Quan Ha, the Silver Team does not turn on him and is ready to fight the UNSC if the need arises. All of this is, of course, very similar to the events of Halo 5 Guardians, where Blue Team also supports Chief against the UNSC. Now, what we don't like about the Halo TV show. Obviously, nothing is perfect, and the Halo TV show is no exception. It's a good enough adaptation of the games, but it also misses the mark on a lot of stuff. For instance, the pacing of the show seems off, with important events happening in quick succession. These could be attributed to the budget and time constraints, though. On the other hand, one thing that just isn't excusable is the show's soundtrack. Everyone knows that Halo has one of the most iconic soundtracks of all time, so when the show only uses a couple of notes in the beginning and pivots off to some generic sci-fi music, it's baffling. We just hope this isn't a permanent choice, and we can hear more of the iconic soundtrack in later episodes. Halo fans are not easy to please. The Halo franchise has a long and decorated history going all the way back to the early 2000s. In fact, it completely revolutionized the genre and made it possible to play an FPS game with a controller, which was not a thing back then. Every Halo release during those days was a massive event, with lines of people waiting outside game stores to get their copy at midnight. However, when Bungie decided to part ways with Microsoft and move on from making Halo, 343 Industries was given the reins of the franchise. And while the games they've made have been good apart from maybe Halo 5, it seems like the hardcore Halo community just can't let go of their nostalgia for the older games. They don't want newer entries to fit in with the current standards of first-person shooters. This is why a lot of their criticisms can come off as short-sighted, and the same could be said for the backlash that the Halo TV show is facing. We're not saying that the show deserves a 10 out of 10 rating across the board, but it's not as bad as people are claiming it to be. In fact, most people who have read up on the Halo lore, including novels, seem to enjoy the show a lot. So if you were on the fence and couldn't decide whether it was worth giving the Halo TV show a shot, it definitely is. That's a wrap for this video. We'll see you in the next one.